Jordan, Bird, Magic, and Jabbar. Or Jerry Rice, Tom Brady, Jim Brown, and Lawrence Taylor. Every sport has the athletes who made it what it is. When the sport of triathlon began, the sport's big four included Dave Scott, Scott Molina, Mark Allen, and today's special guest, two-time Ironman world champ and author, Scott Tinley. Now, you might be thinking, does the word Scott in your name have some sort of aerodynamic advantage? We don't actually get into that. It is interesting to see that combination with those four, but you are going to love this episode. Welcome to the latest episode of the Catalyst Health Wellness and Performance Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Cooper of the Catalyst Coaching Institute, and today we'll definitely be tapping into some great stories from the early days of triathlon, but we're going to go much deeper. Tinley's 2003 book, Racing the Sunset, is a personal favorite of mine that goes well beyond sport to the lives we're living. For our listeners who are already coaching, the event of the year is coming up in Estes Park, Colorado in September. It's the Rocky Mountain Coaching Retreat and Symposium. If that's an interest to you, if you're already a coach, the super early registration discount ends at the end of this month, so don't miss that. Our speaker lineup is outstanding. It includes triathlon Olympic medalist Susan Williams. Details about this incredible event or the upcoming MBHWC approved coaching certification, if that's the route that you're on right now, is available at Catalyst Coaching institute.com and if you want to talk about either one of these just shoot us an email results at catalyst coaching institute.com we'll set up a call now let's transition into this discussion with two-time ironman world champ and best-selling author scott tinley on the latest episode of the catalyst health wellness and performance coaching podcast mr scott tinley it's a pleasure to have you on the catalyst health wellness and performance coaching podcast thanks for joining us thank you dr cooper Really appreciate you guys inviting me over. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Lots to talk about today. So I was watching some interviews with you. You're the two-time winner of the Hawaii Ironman World Championship, 82 and 85. The first one was in 78. You were part of that first generation. You were part of the big four. I, you know, a lot, lot goes in with that. What drew you to that race in the first place? At that time, it wasn't this worldwide sensation. It was something where, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you were kind of like, well, let's give it a go. Well, I- to be fair, I was actually more of a second generation. Um, there was a, a cadre of individuals who, um, yeah, they're foundational members of the multi-sport uh, movement beginning in 71, 72. Um, small cultish sports happening in and around the beaches and the bays of San Diego. I didn't do my first triathlon until 1976. Um, so, you know, myself, Scott Molina, Dave Scott, Mark Allen, um, you know, we, we also have shoulders to stand on. And those were the Tom Warrens yeah, and John Howard. Jerry Paynes and, you know, and, and you, you could go down the list. But, right. Yeah. So w- for you specifically, what made you say, I'm going that route? What was the draw? What was the draw? What, well, what, what makes you sit there and go, ah, you know what? 2.4, 112 marathon. What the heck? The short story is that, um, you know, I, I moved to San Diego from Orange County in 1976 to go to college and uh, somehow ended up watching one of the early triathlons in early August of 76. Okay. And uh, I thought, oh, man, that's just really cool. You know, I mean, <laughs> When's the next one? And the guy's like, well, I don't know if we'll ever do one again, because this is just a mishmash of, of people to coming together and tossing together, you know, swim, bike and run on a Wednesday evening. And but, you know, here's my phone number. And if we do it in the next couple of weeks before uh, before fall sets in, we'll let you know. Right? <laughs> so I got a call and he said, OK, we're going to do the second annual Mission Bay Triathlon. And, uh, you know, it's August 23rd and Wednesday. It's always on a Wednesday night, always in the evening. No permits. Show up. Do you have a bike? I go, no, but my roommate does. <laughs> Borrow the roommate's bike. You know. <laughs> Showed up, ended up third place, had a good time, learned a lot, and said there's something there. I don't know what it is, but if if another one of these things happens in the next decade, I'll be on the starting line. Nice. And, you know, and then the Hawaii thing, you know, that, you know, as the history goes, that all sort of came from some of the early 
competitors, you know, John Collins, et cetera, who participated in those those mid seventies events in San Diego. And, and of course, Collins went on to to uh, be redeployed in Honolulu, took the notion of swim bike run uh, into that venue, and you know, the, the Ironman distances are of course of historical value. As we know, you know the bike, the 2.4 miles from the Waikiki Rough Water Swim, 112 miles from the round, round the island bike race, which actually was 115 miles, and it was done over two days. And they moved they moved the transition three miles so they could swim into the, the right place, and of course the Honolulu Marathon. So right. right, very good. All right, so early 80s, you, Mark Allen, Scott Molina, you trained together in San Diego. I, I did not realize this story. For those of us unfamiliar with triathlon people are listening that'd be like peyton manning tom brady Aaron Rodgers training together you th- you three were three of the best in the sport at the time what was that like it, it it seems like it would be zwift on steroids you know the problem with zwift is everybody's doing too much every single day did that not happen where you know scott was having a good day so he'd pull you and then next day you're crushing it and so mark's staying up with you what was that like it was Mark and I and Scott Molina who were kind of thrown together on um, the first sponsored team, which means they gave us at, at first free jerseys <laughs> and, 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 and spaghetti dinners on Sunday night. And then they threw us a few bucks. Um, and then there was Mark, uh, excuse me, uh, Dave Scott, who was up in Davis, California, kind of the lone wolf doing his lone wolf thing. And um, so Mark and I and Scott Molina, you know, were just tossed together by fate. Scott Molina had moved down to Cal- to San Diego from um, Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh Bay Area spot, and, and Mark Mark had been going had just graduated from UCSD, you know, and I had been there, I don't know for what, for seven or eight years by then, and so you know we we just started hanging out, um, and we learned a lot from each other, and it, it was a kind of one of those things where you looked around and go like, well, we don't know if this thing's ever going to be professional, <laughs> we don't know if there's going to be money. We don't know if we can ever find sponsorship, but right now, all three of us are are kind of looking for the next step in our lives. So why not go for it? Very cool. I, I, the idea of the three of you training together is just just crazy. What did you enjoy when you think about the professional endurance athlete lifestyle? We're gonna, I, I loved your book. We're going to talk about this in a few minutes in terms of transitions, all that. But what did you enjoy most about being a professional endurance athlete? What, what was that like? You mentioned at the early stages, it was, you know, t-shirts, but what, walk us through that. What, what was that early life like as a pro? Well, I, I never envisioned myself as a corporate guy. And I, I've, uh, you know, even though I've had, uh, I've had a lot of very good jobs, none of them have ever been associated with, uh, with corporate culture to the extent where I was sitting in a cubicle. So the idea of autonomy, um, of being beholden to your own efforts and your own trials and tribulations and successes and failures for me, that, that was, um, that was desirable because I had been on team sports where the other people it kind of failed and screwed up the team. Right. Or maybe I failed and screwed up the team. And, and I thought, God, you know, if I'm ever going to be a legitimate sports person, it has to be an individual sport. Mm. And, I, and, and anything I achieve or do not achieve needs to fall on my own acclaim or lack thereof. So, so I, I think that agency w- was a big draw for me then um, and remains so today. You know, I mean, what I do and what I, when I, I can't work for anybody else. Right. I'm unemployable. Put it that way. <laughs> You've worked it out pretty well, my friend. That's good stuff. And the lifestyle itself. So that piece of it, but the travel, the, the, you know, training four five, six hours a day, the, what can you give us a little behind the scenes of what that was really like? Well, it was more, it was more than four or five hours a day. Sure. <laughs> I, I hate to admit it, but yeah, we, we certainly overtrained, but yeah, you, you hit on a couple good ones. Uh, you know, the opportunity to, to, to basically see the world on somebody else's meal ticket. Gosh, I mean, I, I would go to France for the weekend to race and, and I'd, I'd want to race back right after the event on Sunday afternoon because I knew I wanted to be, you know, at a swim workout on, on Monday <laughs> evening. You know, I look at that now and go like, what a jerk. What were you thinking? I did appreciate the travel at many points in my career and, the, and meeting people and uh, experiencing, uh, you know, different, different cultures, different places, different ideals. 
And uh, that was a big draw for sure. And, and I like the fact that, that I wasn't attracted to the compensation because there was none. Sure. At some point we all did pretty well. You know, we had our clothing company and, and that, that certainly helped out. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you ask a kid from the Bronx, man, what's your, what's your dream? He goes, well, are you kidding me? Like every kid from the Bronx, I fall asleep every night dreaming about striking out the side, pitching for the, the Yankees in the bottom of the ninth, seventh game of the series. We're playing the Dodgers and I strike out the side, right? And that's this pipe dream for millions of young kids. And I just happened to, to get a taste of that yeah. for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I appreciate the hell out of that, that I, that I got that taste. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned the four to six, four to six was not accurate. Brad is a lot more than that. I remember storing your book where you'd be pulling out the driveway in your bike while your neighbor was pulling out in his car and he'd be pulling back in from his work day and you'd be pulling back in from your bike. And he's like, dude, were you really riding the entire day? And you're like, hey, you know, it was an easy day, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So you, for lunch. You, you definitely put in the time, no doubt. So with that in mind, we've got a lot of masters athletes that listen to this. A lot of folks are looking for pointers. What, what would you say? You look back and you go, yeah, we completely overtrained. If you were competing as high level as you possibly could in your 40s, 50s, 60s, what would be some advice for folks that are are in those age groups that are saying, I, I don't know, I was I was training 20 hours a week when I was 30 years old. Should I still be training 20 hours a week? Should I be doing more strength training? I, any tips that you've come along the, as you've gone through this process and learned about yourself, folks that you've worked with, people you've talked to, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd say I read more books and, uh, <laughs> and reduce your mileage, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I always think about Max Ehrman's poem, Desiree Dada. There's that, that wonderful line where, where he says, gracefully surrender the things of youth. Um, and I don't know that I have, but, but I, I, I look at, at some of my colleagues who are in my age category, you know, and I'm in my early sixties now and they're, and they're doing pretty damn well. And I sort of, try and understand what methods and, and what practices they use in their thirties, forties and fifties to get to that point where they're still charging in this, this sixth decade. And you know, a lot of it is just, um, it's being smart, listening to you know, what your mama said, everything in moderation and trying to focus on what your body's telling you. So you wake up and you're tired and your training log says, uh, I, you know, you need to, to run, 9.3 miles and you're like, I think I'm only going to run 3.1. You have to be mature enough to surrender those things that you can pull off in your twenties, thirties, and maybe your forties. But dude, you ain't pulling them off in your fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties. They're, they're going to come back and bite you on the ass in one way or another. And have you seen, I, I, I should know this in advance, but are you competing now? What is your, what, what is your goal now? Are you out there just enjoying doing the weekend stuff? Are you every once in a while dialing it in and trying to get everything you got? Where, where, where is your head in terms of not competing at the levels that you were before by any stretch, but getting out there for a real race and lining up with guys and seeing what happens? The last time I, I had the, the faintest notion of being competitive was uh, the Xterra World Championships oh, yeah. in, Mau in Maui. Yeah. I think that was 2017, maybe. And I was going to be in the, uh, the 60 to 69 year old category. And I thought, okay, you know, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post up and see what I can do. So, so for several months ahead of time, I actually focused on, on something more than just participation. Right, right. You know, I did some intervals. I, I, I looked at my mileage. Um, I stretched. <laughs> I ate well. Whoa. Drank less. <laughs> and uh, anyways, the, the race, the race for a variety of reasons did not go well. And I thought, well, that was a total waste of effort. So, so I haven't, I haven't participated in a, in a triathlon in several years. Um, and I have no plans to, um, I, I, I don't follow the sport specifically, but, but I am hopeful for its future in a post COVID world. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I embrace um, what the Olympic movement has done and, and what the USAT, our national governing body has done, but, but there are challenges, you know, uh, you know, I mean, the whole notion of, of Ironman uh, being the, the, you know, the, the ultimate goal for people, uh, you know, that's um, become a kind of mythic fallacy and people need to realize that that is not an achievable thing nor a healthful thing 
if taken to obsession, right? mm. if you can, if you can compete in one or two, right. And, and check that box and you're good with it. And it may, you know, maybe do one a year, that kind of thing. But, you know, people go like, okay, I'm going to do two or three Ironmans a, a year. That's a recipe for, for failure from a variety of, of psychological and more so physiological conditions in your body as you age into the last best trimester of your life. So not to disparage Ironman. They've done amazing things for the sport. We need to rethink what that means to a lot of people. So uh, if I'm hearing you right, you're not announcing your comeback at age 70 today. <laughs> Um, God. There's, only, <laughs> there's only one I don't first of all I, I could certainly couldn't qualify but they used to have this deal where if you ever won the race uh, yeah you know they they did they allow you to come back and and participate I don't know if that's that's still in effect but there's only one way that I would go back and, and participate in the Ironman and that would have to do with you know something like one of my family members really wanting to do it and but uh, other than that I'm, I'm a fan of the Ironman but, you know, I, I, I was there 20 years in a row. I left a wow. lot of blood on that highway. So um, I feel like I've done my part. Yeah. Yeah. No question. All right. We're going to jump into transitions with your, with your book in a minute. But one more question. Knowing what you know today, if you were to go back, you talked about the overtraining. So that would be one piece. But if you were to go back when you were at your peak and change a few things, tweak some things, what, what might that look like? What would be some of those things? You mentioned the travel. You'd soak in the travel a little bit more. But in terms yeah. of the training piece, in terms of the lifestyle piece, what might be different? I, I, I don't know, Brad. I, you know, I mean, I, I tend not to to, to, to want to rethink or, or go down that path of regret. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly we, we, we all could. It's one of those cliches. Like, if, if I knew then what I know Sure, now, sure. Right? Yeah. And, and this gives you that opportunity to do that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, look, I made decisions based upon what information – um, I had in my quiver at the time. It wasn't always correct. Sometimes it was right on. Sometimes I was lucky. Sometimes it was due to the research I had done. But I, I think if, if there is one general thing that I would suggest to your listeners would be that there's your heart and your emotions and your spirit that drives you on. And there's a, there's a rationality of what your body can do physiologically. And, and somewhere in the middle – it's the correct place to be because, you know, you, you can't exist like only focusing on, you know, on a screen, on a power meter, because, you, you know, you're going to become a freaking robot. Right. And, and that's no fun. And certainly, you know, we, we know that the early history of the sport has more organic characters, should we say, um, than exist now. But that said, it would be nice to, to have had more data. And I didn't have a coach. There were no coaches. Yeah, there's, no video, there's no books. I look, you know, we were lab rats making this shit up. Well, and even and, aero bars, right? You, didn't you transition into the aero bars? You didn't have them early on. You had them a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Anyways. So it, it, it would have been nice to, to get some feedback, but I don't know where that would have come from. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Good stuff. All right. So let, let's touch with your book. I, I read it. You wrote it in 03, I believe, didn't you? 2003? Um, yeah, first version came out in 03. There's an updated version that's like 09, I think, that includes more more research and more data. But yeah, the first version was uh, right around that early 2002, 2003 period. So I dug into the 2003 one, and I can't tell you your first sentence. I'm just going to read it for, for everybody that's out there that maybe hasn't read it yet. It was a hawk that ended my career. I cannot tell you, my friend, how many times that sentence has popped into my head when I'm out riding or running or I'm in a race or something like that. It's it's a so powerful. Can you expand upon what, where that went? What, what that, what you meant by that? Well, I, I, I was, I just would have been around 2000 and no, no, 1999 ish. And let's see, I was 42 at the time. And I was trying to milk my career. I, you know, I wasn't looking forward to, 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 to finding a corporate job or starting all over again. Sure. And, but, you know, but I had a house payment and a wife and two kids. <laughs> and, you know, like, you know, I got to get my shit together at some point. Right, right. Yeah, come on, Peter Pan, you got to grow up. <laughs> so I was at an event somewhere in the Midwest. And I was kind of hopeful that I'd, you know, be in the top five, top 10 worst. You know, I was having a bad day. And suddenly I'm on the run with cramps. You know, think, you know, I'm shedding parts everywhere. 
And I just kind of stopped and I looked around and, and people took, you know, like, you know, from the age group behind me are passing me. <laughs> you know, I started with the Oh, we've all been there. <laughs> and people are passing me and I'm just going like, I suck. But then there was a hawk, you know, and I kind of sat there. You know, I'm a huge fan of, of predatory birds, particularly red tail and Cooper's hawks. And I said, this red tail. And he's kind of like, wah, 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 you, you know, and I go like, that's so beautiful. That's so amazing. You know, I, I should pay more attention to nature. Oh, by the way, you're in a race. You might want to finish the <laughs> event first. <laughs> so that, that's where that sentence came from. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's interesting. There's things that stick out with us when, when we go through that kind of stuff. So a lot of our listeners are in the midst of some sort of transition. It, it may be with racing. It might be age. It might be with a, a relationship or career or, or whatever. So I'd like to touch on some of that because that was, that was really what you dialed in in this book. Why did you decide to devote your time and energy to studying this topic of transitions for athletes in the first place? Was it, was it autobiographical? Was it you're trying to discover your own journey? Or was there something else that drew you to that? What, what took you down that path? Um, well, to be honest, Brad, it was because I was all messed up. <laughs> I didn't know where I was going. I was confused about my next place in life. And, you know, 42, 43 years old, it's, you know, it's the year 2000, the cusp of a new millennia. And, uh, and, you know, I knew I had options, you know, I wasn't broke. I had some skills and, uh, uh but I didn't see myself wanting to be, you know, a salesman or a coach or, you know, something that would have just been an extension of what I'd been doing for the last 15 years. So I started talking with retired professional mm -hmm. athletes, yeah, individuals who I'd met along the way, or people were, you know, giving me contacts, asking them, you know, what were some of the contexts that affected your transition, both positive or negative? You know, what were some of the, the details that, that might have uh, contributed to how you're doing now or how you wish you were doing now? And, you know, and I found that, that not only was it largely understudied, but, but so much of, of what we were learning from, you know, this, this condensed version of life transition could be transformative to, as you know, other areas of life, relationships, particular school programs, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So I just threw myself into it. And it, I went back to, to graduate school. It, it ended up being uh, um, my first master's thesis. And then, you know, ultimately it was my PhD dissertation a decade later um, and the book came along and um, yeah, it, it, it was a cool thing because it was one of those deals where you do it first thinking, I, you know, you're a little selfish, you know, focusing only on, on, on what you need, but, but then, you know, just over the years, you know, having these discussions with people who read the book or who, who came to the conferences that we put on or somehow connected with, with the data that we had published, like, you know, when they say that, you know, that was cool, that that was that was important for me to, to understand um, because I hadn't thought about it before. Anyways, th that's that's the, the long version of, yeah. of where it came from. What surprised you? I won't say most, but what were some of the things that surprised you in your findings as you dug into this, as you talked to these different people, as you collected the data? Did, did you come out saying, OK, well, I, I figured that's how it would be. Or did you come out of it saying never thought not never saw this coming no there was a couple of contexts that that were were very surprising and, and they go they go against what popular culture and what particular media forms have professed before one of them had to do with financial status and what i found was that if you retired or were transitioning with a a whole bunch of money or you never had to work again or b it, you know, if you're in a sport that you, you, there was no compensation, you know, like I have a niece who was uh, a gold medalist in women's water polo, but she, she didn't retire with any money in the bank. Sure, sure. So, so the better context was to have have a certain amount of capital and, and ability to transition. So you had some resources that give you two, three, four years where you could go back to school. You could find a new job. You could start your own business. So so, so that was interesting um, because if you had too much money or not enough you were less well off than if you had what some of my friends call fuck you money. Right. So right. which means you can kind of do what you want. For right. A right. While. Right. Yeah. That was a cool one. And the other one was um, trying to, to, to figure out why females had female athletes had less emotional trauma in transition. Hmm. 
Mm. And again, popular culture and some shallow research had suggested that it was because they could refocus their identity in a matriarchal role. Okay, I'm going to go from being the best tennis place tennis player in the world. Now I'm going to be a mother, it, it, you know, and that's a simple transition because being a mother is so uh, self uh, fulfilling in that identity place that it, it it replaces everything I was getting from being, you know, a, a female professional athlete. That wasn't the case. Hmm. What we found was that female athletes often trans transition better because a um, they've been transitioning and dealing with the bullshit of, of male patriarchy in the world of sports for 250 years, right, in America, or worse. Right. And that the, they've always, in their mind, thought, okay, if, if I can make some money, if I can get a sponsorship, if I can have a couple good years, that's great. And so the level of appreciation for what they were given, again, female athletes, way higher than what many males were able to acclaim. And so when female athletes retired, they're like, hey, I had a good time. You know, I traveled the world, I made some money, uh, I met a lot of people, I'm super fit, I, you know, I learned how to be healthy, and now I'm gonna move on to the next thing in my life, mm. whatever that. So so, so that, uh, sort of the outset of, of being a female, again, in, in a, a traditionally uh, formatted male world of sports, um, you know, was to their advantage. Did it help you as you talked to these folks, as you collected the data, did it help you with your transition? Did it make it more difficult? Because all of a sudden you're completely focused in on it. What, what? Yeah. What, what do you think psychotherapy is? <laughs> totally. I, I didn't have to pay a counselor because I was talking to people. <laughs> yes. It, no, it, it was fantastic for me. And, it, and honestly, um, one of the first things that happened to me, God, I'll never forget this part, you know, where I was confused by, by how, you know, where I'm going to go next and, and, and what about, you know, supporting my family and my kids and et cetera. Uh, this, this friend of mine says, Oh, you got to talk to this guy, Jerry Shirk, Jerry Shirk. Oh yeah. He was a, he was a linebacker for the, for the green Bay Packers, you know, between like 1973 and 1978 or something. Like, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jerry Shirk has studied this stuff and he's, he really understands it. So I go meet Jerry Shirk. You know, this guy's like, 612 you know he's a gentle giant a beautiful man and, and the first thing he says to me he goes he goes you know scott the sooner you can realize that the best part of your life is over the sooner you can get on to having a decent second half <laughs> wow and, and i thought okay <laughs> first of all that's harsh second of all it's brilliant and third that's exactly what i needed to hear wow wow and then you had several moments like that where people just said something that you went yeah that's critical all day long. Yeah. It was, it, it was, it was a gift for me to find that passion and, and to go down that rabbit hole of experience because, you know, I mean, quite honestly, a, a lot of people in transition, they try different things that don't work and they get frustrated. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried this job. I went into this relationship. Uh, you know, I tried this, this school program and it's, it's not happening. And they go, okay, dead end, dead end, dead end. Where do I go now? Right. Well, you go back to the crossroads and you try something else. Eventually one of those avenues will work. So someone who's listening to this and they're thinking, yeah, I'm in that transition now to any of those categories we talked about, what advice would you have for them? If they were sitting down with you and saying, Scott, you know, you've been through this, you wrote about it. I'm struggling. I'm not sure whether to make the transition, whether or not, whether to take this route or that route, what, what, what guidance would you give them? Well, I mean, certainly you, you have to follow your heart, whatever that means. Um, you know, sometimes uh, the intuition is, is way more, uh, way smarter than your rational ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would certainly talk to as many people as possible. You know, I mean, just pull people uh, uh, you know aside in the middle of the, the sidewalk. Hey, can I ask you a question? Right? You know, <laughs> I, I need some advice. <laughs> I, I can go this way, or I can go that way. So follow your heart. Talk to a whole bunch of people. Find professional help, man. There's there's some great people out there now who are who are doing amazing work you know, in counseling therapy that focuses on transition. And if you don't like the person, the first couple of times you talk to them, find somebody else. You know what I mean? Eventually you will, you will connect with, you know, someone who's going to help you with your mental health. And, you know, and that unfortunately has been a stigma for yeah. our society for many years. Sure. It's like, Oh, what's wrong with you? 
yeah, you're seeing a shrink. Should I put you in a home? Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm just going to get my shit together, man. Find someone who can help me. So the first one you mentioned was follow your heart. And then you subtly kind of under your breath said, whatever that means. What, what does it mean to you? Why did it come up first? Why did you say number one, a, because I, I, you're not alone. I think we all go, but I'm not really sure what that means. Yeah. Well, if, if I knew exactly what it means and I could bottle it up and sell it, I wouldn't be a school teacher now. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think most people have an inclination as to where, where they should be in their life at any particular point in time. And, but, but there's this level of fear about what it may cost for them to move in that direction. I'm unhappy in a relationship. I, I don't like I, that I only have a college degree. I don't like this job. You know, I don't like where I live. I don't belong here or there. And so they do this sort of very rational risk reward ratio balance sheet. And, and then they, they come up with the answer that's okay. Well, right now it's not a good time. When is a better time? Yeah. You know, is it next week, next year, five years? So, so that whole notion of following your heart is, is, you know, at some point, once you do all your homework, sometimes you just got to close your eyes and jump. And if you land smoothly and everything's great, then good on you. But if you hit a rocky bottom and you got to climb back up the cliff, then, oh my God, now I sound like Tony Robbins or something. <laughs> Cut me off. Go get him, Tony. Um, all right. So books written not quite 20 years ago, you redid it. You said it was some more science about 2009. If you were to rewrite it today, what would you add? Would there be a new chapter? Would there be a, a new approach that you'd say, you know what? I would like to add this extra one on A. You, you know, you, I mean, I've written seven or eight books and, and each, each of them could certainly be much better, <laughs> particularly the ones that I wrote after Race in the Sunset, where, you know, where I felt they were under edited and I read them now and I go, God, mm. well, how did I screw up that, that sure. chapter? Um, I, you look, you put things out there at any given time based upon where you are in your life and what you know, what you've achieved and how good you feel about exposing yourself, you know, through a published narrative. Uh, and you can't go back. You know, it's like, it's a timestamp. There it is. You know, it's like, it's like your grandma takes a picture of you at 10 years old. And she carries it around, you know, and you're 16 going like, oh, I was such a dork when I was 10. Mom can, or grandma, can you just like make my hair longer or blonder or something? You're like, no, that's you at 10 and you got to own it. You were 47 when the book was published approximately, right? About 17 uh, years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. So using that example of your grandma, you've gone through some other transitions since that time, I'm guessing. Did this... Did the perspective as an athlete transitioning help you with the next transition? And if so, no. I don't know if it did or not. I, I think uh, probably not. I should, you know, I, I should probably go back and read my own stuff. <laughs> that's that's what I was thinking. Come on, dude. I mean, no, look, I, you know, and things have been pretty well for me, you know, over the past decade or so, but there's been some, some rough points and, you know, I, I think innately once you go through those and, you know, you experience um, what works and what doesn't work. Let, later in your life, you know, you don't sit down, you know, with a yellow legal pad and go, okay, I did this, then I should do that. Right? More it's you trust your experience and your thoughts and you stay awake late at night and you think, okay, I really need to do this, not that. So the other large group of our listeners are health and wellness coaches. They're coming alongside people, helping them think through where are they going with their life, where they're going with their health, their wellness or performance, et cetera. What, what advice would you give to them? Because many of their clients are coming to them in the midst of some sort of transition. Maybe it's just, I want to lose weight. Maybe it's school pursuit. Maybe it's a career thought, but you mentioned some things of what you would say directly is there a one-off where you'd say, well, have them keep this in mind? Yeah, that's a good question, Brad. Um, particularly in, in the midst of this pandemic crisis mm. where so many of us are, um, we're struggling for things that we've lost and we don't know how to 
safely find them again. Yeah. I was telling somebody the other day, they go like, what do you miss the most? And I was like, I go kissing people on the lips. And <laughs> he's like, wow, that's gross. I go, <laughs> I just it popped in my head. Right? I don't care. You know, it's like my dead grandmother or my little sister or whatever. It's just, you know, one of those things. But anyways, um, I think that we have to be brutally honest with ourselves. You know, where, where are we in our lives? What, what have we achieved to date that we can be proud of? And, and what might we strive to accomplish to the best of our abilities in a challenging time in the time that we have left? And these are sort of substantial questions of, of existential reality. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't want to go there because it sounds too heavy. What are you talking about? Like, what do you want to do before you die? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Bucket list stuff. Right. But it doesn't have to be that dramatic and, you know, and that over the top. You know, you can just start with a small list. You know, I wouldn't mind doing this in the next two weeks. Right? Yeah. You don't even have to do the list. Just, you know, write it on the old Palm Pilot right yeah. there. You know, yeah. yeah. Like, ride my bike. You know? That Palm Pilot was a, a callback for folks that are like, wait, what is he talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Uh, transitions, obviously not a one-time thing. Is there a transition you're going through now? Is there something you're facing now? And if so, what are you learning through the process? Yes. Um, I'm not going totally public with it, but, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think it's this, uh, you are coming back of, at age 70, aren't you? Yeah, really. <laughs> so a, lot of, a lot of it's just this, you know, this general fragility of, of life. You don't truly expect it or experience it or admire just how crazy all this beautiful thing that, that we can appreciate can go away just like that until you start to until you've lost a few things that mean a lot to you yeah. you know it might be a loved one it might be a sense it might be part of your health occupation etc and then suddenly you go like wow i had all that and now i don't have all that so it really gets back to to what I said about female athletes appreciating uh, what they had. The more that I can appreciate what I've been able to accomplish or what I've been gifted or, or what my parents brought me growing up, you know, or coaches, teachers, colleagues, et cetera, then the happier I am. You know, I'm not I'm not wishing I had something. I'm I'm appreciating what I have. And that's new for you. That's that's a big one. And that's, and that's a lesson that I have to remind myself every day. Yeah. Like, okay. Just, it ain't that bad. There's a lot of people who have a way worse. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. Scott, I really appreciate it. Best way for listeners to keep up with you. You on Instagram. Um, yeah, I, I have social media. I don't use it much. <laughs> I, have, I have a couple of Facebooks account. I have an Insta account. Um, I have a website. I don't, post anything there. <laughs> Scott at scotttinley.com. Okay. But you can get a hold of me. That's my email. Okay. And then um, we have we have tryhistory.com if you're interested in the, the history of triathlon on tri history.com. So that's a, that's a really cool site that we've been sort of chronicling and putting together a lot of images and stories about what happened in sports, multi sports in the past. Very cool. Shameless plug for my novel, right? Yeah. In the wake of our past. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Scott, thanks so much. I know it was tough for us to get this on the calendar, but really appreciate your time. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Same, Brad. All right. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. You didn't realize world-class athletes could be so philosophical, did you? Thanks again to author and two-time Ironman world champ, Scott Tinley, for sharing his time with us. Thank you to you for tuning into the number one podcast for health and wellness coaching next week. Next week's one of our hidden gem episodes. It features Dr. Lisa Bellinger discussing how to maximize both our physical and our mental well-being. As always, feel free to reach out to us with any questions about your current or future coaching career results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. We can set up a call or tap into additional health, wellness, performance resources on the website at Catalyst Coaching institute.com. Now let's go be a catalyst, making a positive impact in the lives of our clients, our community, without burning ourselves out in the process. This is Dr. Bradford Cooper of the Catalyst Coaching Institute. I'll speak with you soon on another episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness and Performance Coaching Podcast, or 
Maybe over on the new YouTube coaching channel.